Hi everyone. Today we're going to be looking at simulating some biopolymers with non-canonical amino acids with the toolkit. If anyone's ever tried to do this with existing tools, it's a real pain. You have to combine a force field that will handle your protein really well with a general force field that can handle more general chemistry. So you need to be able to parameterize that. And existing tools just don't do this automatically. So you have to do it by hand and then you have to guess how to stick them together and hope that your hand edited topology files are correct. Because of the way we design force fields, in principle, using non-canonical amino acids is no harder than using canonical amino acids. But of course you need software support for that and that's not entirely in place. So in the new update in version 0.11, we just got to a point where it's really like possible to do non-canonical amino acids and biopolymers. And so that's what we want to show you, the promise that our technique has for this sort of workflow. Uh, and this, this is just going to get better in the, the next year or so as the Rosemary force field comes out, which will have proper protein support. And as we figure out a robust API for teaching the toolkit about non-canonical amino acids. Today, we're going to introduce the new biopolymer support in the toolkit and just demonstrate that biopolymers work exactly the same as any other molecule. We're going to demonstrate a way to load a protein that has a non-canonical amino acid into the toolkit. Then we're going to use the toolkit to prepare a force field for proteins with that non-canonical amino acid, which is going to be a particular synthetic fluorophore. Finally, we're going to use the toolkit to simulate our labeled protein with OpenMM. So the first thing we do is obviously import everything. The one thing I want to mention here is this utils module, which is distributed with the notebook. It just has a bunch of code that isn't particularly interesting, but is very long. And so it's, it's there if you want to look at it, but it's, it's just code that we're going to use, but not talk about how it works. It's somewhat commented and documented in the utils module. So if you want to have a look at how it works, it's there. So the first thing we're going to do is actually load an unlabeled peptide into the toolkit and just show that it's just like every other molecule. So the way the toolkit works, if you haven't used it before, is we load molecules into the molecule class and the molecule class stores a chemical graph, basically. Uh, you can add some annotations to it, but basically it's a, a chemical graph that identifies a particular chemical species. And then we can combine molecules into a topology and then the topology can be combined with a force field to get an OpenM system or an interchange for exporting to other MD engines. So I've distributed a PDB that has um, an ACE and N-methyl group capped uh, A5, cysteine A5 peptide in it. So you can see uh, it's a helical little peptide. I haven't displayed the side chains here. Uh, these little licorice bits at the end are just the caps because NGLView doesn't know how to display them. They are bonded, it's just NGLView being a bit odd. What are the known residues that it knows about in the from polymer PDB uh, method? Right. So it currently knows the 20 canonical amino acid residues and a bunch of their like protonated, deprotonated forms. And it knows acetyl caps and N methyl caps, and it doesn't know anything else which is why we have to go to this work to teach it about a non-canonical amino acid. The plans for future support of new residues is that we want to do it and we haven't figured out how we're going to do it yet. If, if I could cut in, we have a, yeah, a variety of options and we're looking at basically ways that will be good for the future. So the, the past few months we've been scrambling to, to have a production ready variant of from polymer PDB that needs to operate perfectly for the 20 amino acids. And now that we have that out in the wild, us and probably uh, in conjunction with Open Free Energy and the Shirts Lab are going to be exploring sort of now a more extensible way to like define new residues and be able to load them from PDB as well. Aspirationally, we wanna handle, um, of course, all proteins and, and amino acid variants defined by the PDB. We wanna handle other polymers like DNA and RNA and other common, um, probably sugars as well, but I know sugars their branching structure can be extra complex. So maybe they'll come in a third generation. Uh, yeah, but we, we do plan to expand this functionality a lot. And also, so if you have an SDF file of your protein or you have a smiles of your protein, then you can load that in directly. You don't need to work with this from polymer PDB method. 
but this molecule that we've just created, this A5CA5, is just a regular molecule. So anything that you do with any other molecule, you can do with this. So one of the new features we've added to all molecules is hierarchy schemes. Uh, and the point of hierarchy schemes is that a lot of cheminformatics toolkits have, and, and the PDB format itself, actually has this scheme for iterating over atoms within a molecule, which is, or within a topology, which is chains and residues. The idea is that a chain is a single polymer chain that's, you know, translated or transcribed all at once. And a residue is a particular amino acid or nucleotide residue within that. And we didn't want to have this very protein specific bespoke iteration method in our molecule class. So we came up with this abstraction called the hierarchy scheme. A molecule can have any number of hierarchy schemes. Uh, by default, polymers loaded from PDB have these two chains and residues. So exactly the same as other cheminformatics toolkits. And the way a hierarchy scheme is uh, defined is that you give it these uniqueness criteria. So our chains hierarchy scheme has the uniqueness criteria chain ID, and the residues hierarchy scheme has the uniqueness uh, uh, criteria of all this stuff. And the idea is that every atom with the same values for these metadata keys gets the same residue, or every atom with the same set of these metadata values gets the same chain. So that lets us iterate over anything you can think of to iterate over atoms, as long as you can express it as metadata on an atom and some combination of uniqueness criteria. So this is a really flexible scheme that we anticipate can be used in ways that we haven't thought of yet, but it also works really nicely for residues and chains. And we go to a lot of work to make sure that when you load a PDB or you load a protein, there's a good chance that you'll be able to iterate over, over it like this. And if you can't, we provide pretty simple methods to allow you to. I'm just going to demonstrate how this works. This loop uh, iterates over all the residues in this residues iterator. This residues iterator is created because of the hierarchy scheme. So What's that and 13 elements at the end of the residue definition. Right. So that's saying that the this molecule has 13 residues. So ah, it's that's got 13 not, okay. elements of the hierarchy scheme. So yeah, they're um, iterator elements, not chemical elements. Okay, so we're iterating over our residues. We're going to take the first atom in each residue and just check that it's got the same metadata as for, for the uniqueness criteria of residues as every other atom. And then I'm just going to print each atom, uh, each residue with its atoms. And you can see this gives exactly what you'd expect in any cheminformatics toolkit. And so this lets us iterate over chains and residues really simply without having to shoehorn the idea of a residue into every molecule. Uh, and the metadata is just a dictionary that maps from strings to either integers or strings. So you can put whatever data you want in that dictionary. But apart from its predefined hierarchy schemes, a peptide is just a regular molecule, any biopolymer, just the same as any other molecule. For instance, we can convert it to smiles. No, no worries. You get a very long smiles. And this is for 11 amino acid residues. So you can imagine for a real protein, this, these get very long, but there's no problem with it. You can just convert things to smiles. And like I said before, topology is a group of molecules, possibly with box vectors and positions, and we can convert our molecule to a topology just like we would any other molecule. Okay, so now that we've got our unlabeled biopolymer, we're going to label it with a fluorescent dye. The, the problem is that it's really unusual to have an SDF file or a smile string of an entire protein, or especially of a protein label with a non-canonical amino acid. And PDBs don't include enough chemical information to unambiguously get a chemical graph out of them, unless you make assumptions about connect records and no one knows what those assumptions are and different tools disagree about them. So it's just not worth doing if we want to avoid errors. So we're going to use our dkit to manually add a modification to the peptide we've already got. So this is fluorescein 5 maleamide This is a really bright um, synthetic fluorescent dye. 
and it's bonded to this malayamide group. Malayamide groups are great because they do this click reaction with a cysteine, it's conjugate addition against this across this double bond. And then, then you've got a labeled peptide. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to use our kit to form this reaction. And then we'll have a smile string that we can use moving forward. So we thought about a lot of different ways to modify a, a molecule. Originally, this involved like manually editing smile strings. And we eventually settled on this method, which is um, our kit provides a way to apply a reaction to molecules from smarts. So I've written this reaction smarts, which says take a thiol group and take a malayamide and give me a thiolated malayamide. If I run this reaction, we can see this is the molecule that we get out. And that's exactly what we're looking for. Um, I did have a question. Is there any way to control the chirality of that product or you just kind of take what you're given? Uh, so this reaction smarts specifies the chirality of that product. So if okay. I put an extra at in there, you get the other enantiomer. Oh, great. And actually the toolkit will not accept smiles that don't specify all of the stereochemistry. You can tell it to just get over itself and accept them. But by default, we quite specifically avoid that particular issue. Now we've got a RD kit. Uh, molecule for this, we've got a smiles and smiles are really good because we can use them with this from PDB and smiles method. And the way it works is you take a PDB, which doesn't have chemical information. You take a smiles, which doesn't have anything but chemical information. You make sure the smiles works with the PDB and then you get out a molecule. I've provided a PDB of, of the modified peptide with the notebook, and we're just going to use this method to load it in. And if we do that, we magically get our peptide. I've represented it in licorice rather than the default representation so that we can see that it's actually right. So it's, it's got the positions from the PDB rather than generating new positions. And we can see it's also taken the residue information from the PDB. So I've given it this new dye residue so that we can identify it later. And so this is sort of the superpower of the toolkit is that everything's just a molecule. So anything you can do with a molecule you can do with all of it. And that means exporting things to RD kit and then re-importing them in various different ways. Obviously there's a million different ways to get to this point where you have a molecule of your non-canonical amino acid. This is the easiest way for this example, we think. But obviously, if you want to do some other PTM, you need to write a new reaction smarts, which ended up being a real pain when I tried to do it the other day. You may want to create your molecule in some other software and export it to an SDF or just manually edit smile strings or something else. The point is that it doesn't matter how you get to this point. Once you have a molecule, we can parameterize it. If you import from an SD file, you don't get the, the hierarchical naming. Is that important for the rest of the tutorial? Uh, it is, but it's pretty easy to work around. So uh, there's a method on molecule called perceive residues that it, it applies a bunch of smarts rules to the, the molecule to identify amino acid residues. And you can get residues out of that. There will be one or two changes you might have to make to one or two cells and you'll be able to apply the, the rest of the notebook, no worries. Is there something like from PDB and SDF or PDB and mole? Uh, yep. The way to do it would be to load the SDF or the mole into a molecule and then produce a smiles from that molecule and okay. use P from PDB and smiles. So um, when we do this from PDB and smiles, we have this PDB with the dye on it named as dye in the rest name, right? Mm -hmm. But we don't know the chemistry of that, so we add the smiles for mm -hmm. the molecule to know what's what's the chemistry. That's right. Basically, is that what's happening? Yeah, that's exactly what's happening. If we if we have more than one molecule or one residue in the in the PDB that we want to specify, is this possible? No, this method will fail if you do that. Okay, you can work around that with OpenMM. If you have a look in the utils module, there's a, a method called Solvate, and right. it demonstrates a way of loading a multiple molecule PDB through OpenMM, but you just need to check your work. Like we're, we, we can be re relatively confident in that this will either do the, what you expected or error out. 
but when there's more molecules then there's more opportunities to go wrong so we oh, oh, support that i way. i mean i mean when we have more than one residue that we need to that we need oh. the smiles for so the smiles is all or nothing it has to describe the entire uh polymer it has to entirely describe the entire pdp oh right we have the smile for the whole thing oh i see yeah you can just iteratively apply this reaction smart so if you had like multiple cysteines that you wanted to label for instance and then once you've got the whole molecule out yeah this this needs a uh, smiles for everything that's in the picture so now that we've loaded a post-translationally modified peptide into the toolkit let's parameterize this is obviously the pain point in a traditional uh workflow for non-canonical amino acids i've done this more times during my phd than i want to really think about but the nice thing about Smirnoff force fields is that we just define this is a general force field and this is a specific force field. And it will apply this to everything it can and then anything that's left behind gets this. And that's just lovely. Like being able to combine force fields is really useful. The caveat is that you're combining force fields. And so you need to be really sure that the parameters are compatible. So OpenFF 2.0 Sage uses the same charge generation method or very similar charge. I think it's actually the same charge generation method as, as Amber. The band walls are all derived from GAF, which is compatible with, with Amber. Uh, we've done a lot of refitting over them, but while this has never really been rigorously tested and you probably shouldn't use it in production unless you're gonna check it yourself, we, we have like good reason to hope that these will work together. And this situation will get much better in the next release of open force field, which will have protein parameters. And so you could parameterize a protein just with this, but it wouldn't do very well because we'd be using general parameters for proteins. So all your backgrounds would probably be very similar and stuff like that. This gets us better quality proteins at the risk of some compatibility issues that we hope are pretty small, but the new OpenFF Rosemary will be the best of both worlds. We'll have good protein parameters and we'll handle general chemistry in a way that has been optimized together. So if you want to use this in, in a paper, I would suggest waiting for Rosemary, which should be out next year, hopefully early next year. You made a comment that they're using compatible charge methods, but I think FF14SB probably uses RESP-derived charges, whereas the OpenFF line to date all use AM1BCC. Normally, those have been treated as compatible, even though they're not the same. Yeah, this is pro isn't probably the worst thing in the world to do, but uh, be careful when you do it yourself. The problem with the way the toolkit applies charges is that to generate charges for a molecule, you need to do a quantum calculation on the entire molecule. And if you're doing a quantum calculation on a protein, that takes a very long time. So what we're going to do is we're going to compute charges from just the residue that we're trying to charge. And then we're going to translate those charges into the general force field so that we can apply them to that residue whenever we see it without having to recalculate charges. Just to demonstrate how this works, the new force field that we're creating here works out as a bunch of uh, parameter handlers that each have parameters. And so if we pull out the alanine parameters from this combined force field, then we can see it's a smirx, which is like a smiles, but with numbers attached, and then a, a bunch of charge parameters. This smirx matches an alanine, and it just labels every atom in the alanine with a number, and then the parameters assign charges to the atoms with that number. So this is charge one, which corresponds to this index. So this is the backbone nitrogen's charge, and so on for all of the charges in the residue. So this is the information we need to get. We need to get charges for the atoms in the residue, and we need a smirx for the residue. Since we want some electrostatic context, we don't just want to be simulating like the charges for free floating labeled cysteine. We're going to just apply a reaction smarts to locate the labeled cysteine residue, cap it with the same acetyl and N methyl caps that we've been using, and then we'll have something to charge. This function just converts things to our D kit, applies the reaction, which just takes a protein residue and caps either end of it, then iterates over all of the possible products when you run this reaction on the input molecule and identifies the one 
that has the residue name that we give it and pulls it out and then make sure that our metadata is, is up to date. Don't worry if you don't understand that, any method of getting a capped residue will work. Um, so I've just given it the labeled molecule that we came up with, the residue name that we gave it, and told it that undefined stereochemistry is okay. The reason I have to do that is because this, this center here, which is not chiral because these two are symmetric, sometimes thinks it's chiral because of the keculization of, of this ring system. So we have to tell it that the undefined stereo is okay, but this is fine because we know that um, we know that it's accepted it previously. So we know we're in the clear. Okay, now we're gonna assign partial charges. Toolkit provides this really easy method to assign partial charges. This step is the reason we use OpenEye. So this step is much faster if you have our OpenEye installed than, than if you're using our DKIT. But this, this whole thing will get easier when we eventually support graph charges in the toolkit, which is a machine learning method for generating charges directly from the molecular graph rather than going through the rigmarole of computing a whole bunch of different confirmations and doing a quantum calculation on each of them. We're just going straight from the graph to the charges. It's not ready yet, but once it is, this step will be much faster and we'll probably be able to just assign partial charges to the entire protein rather than doing it specifically for this residue. We've got our partial charges out. We only want the charges for the residue itself, not the, the caps that we've added. So we can do this just by using our residue hierarchy scheme. So since we've got residues in our capped amino acid, we can just say we want to take all the atoms that aren't the caps and we'll get a list of atom indices. The toolkit generates charges that sum to an integer over the entire molecule, but we need it to sum to an integer over just the residue that we want to include in the library charges. So we need to compute an offset. And then we need this smarts code. So up here, we have this smokes code. Smokes and smarts are the same thing. We need one for our new residue. So there's a great little tool called Kemper, which can do this for us. So we just say, here's a molecule. Here are the indices that we want a smarts for. Give us a smarts. And we get this. Again, it's a smirks, but they're like subsets of each other. This is a very specific smirks. It specifies like all of the possible things that you can specify in a smirks. So this is very unambiguous. And you can see that it labels each atom. So everything in a square bracket is an atom. The first little number after the hash is the atomic number. Then there's a bunch of like, how many bonds does this have? How many hydrogens are attached? What's its hybridization status? Or the, what's its charge? And then an, a colon and then an index. And this index is going to do the same thing as um, these indices that lets us apply charges. So we've got our smarts. Then we just need to combine our smarts with the charges that we calculated earlier and put them into the library charges parameter handler of the force field. So we just iterate over the indices that we computed. So the indices that exclude the caps and we can enumerate them to get the corresponding smirks atom index from Kemper. And then we can just say, all right, the charge of that index is the partial charge plus the charge offset. And then that can go straight into our parameter handler. Now that we've modified our force field, we can save it to disk so that we can distribute it with our paper or apply it to other molecules later or put it on some preprint server or whatever. We, we save it to file and then we have our augmented force field forever. So now we've got our force field, we can check that it parameterizes our molecule correctly. So these are just methods, functions that are in the utils module that we talked about. They're not optimized or particularly clever. They just give us some, some coloring so that we can see whether we've done the right thing. So here we are coloring atoms by where they got their charges from. So the amber colored atoms get their charges from amber and these lilac colored atoms are the ones that we just added. We can check that the charges are reasonable. So, all right, 
the backbone nitrogen is negative, our nitrogen is negative, our oxygen is negative, our carbons and hydrogens are relatively low. That looks fairly reasonable to me. We actually check that they're correct, but it looks reasonable as well. Uh, we can color bonds by where they got them from. So we can see all of the bonds that would be present in a regular peptide are from amber, including the backbone bonds for the sulfur. And then the new bonds are taken from sage. That's why they're, they're colored green. And we can do the same thing with the torsions. So in this one, darker colors uh, imply that there are more torsions over that bond. Uh, green is torsions from sage. Yellow is torsions from amber. If there was a bond that had torsions from both, it would be like a green and yellow color, but we don't have any of those. Okay, so our parameterization looks good. There's no obvious errors. If you're going to do this for real, you would do more than looking at colors, but I think we're about ready to simulate. So we had our labeled molecule and we needed to create parameters for it. The first thing we did was combine our general force field with our protein force field so that we would have highly specific protein parameters for the bits that they exist for. And then we could fall back to our general SAGE force field for our non-canonical amino acid. Then we had to generate charges. We could have just let the toolkit do this automatically, but it would have taken a very long time because it would have had to run quantum calculations on the entire molecule. So instead we ran our own calculations using the toolkit on a trimmed down version of the protein. And then we took those charges and injected them into the force field so that we could reuse it later. Um, and so that you could translate the charges that we got for our trim down molecule onto the whole force field. All of these steps will be easier in the future with, with a later force field because that will have a new charge generation method that will hopefully scale to an entire protein and will have uh, protein parameters in the, the OpenFF force field. But for the time being, you need to do a lot of work to get this done in a reasonable amount of time. Okay, so the last thing to do is simulate. I don't think this has changed in a long time. Um, we first need to create a topology, which includes all the molecules in the system. We're not going to solvate because we want this to run quickly. There's a solvation method in the utils module if you want to experiment with it. But basically, we just take the molecule, add it to a topology on its own, give it box vectors, and create an open system out of it. This step parameterizes the topology with this force. If we hadn't put the library charges in, this step would calculate the charges on the whole protein. And if you want to spin your CPU, you can try that on the whole protein without adding the, the library charges in the CPU. And then we set up the OpenMM simulation by creating an integrator, giving the OpenMM version of the topology to the simulation, along with the, the system that we just generated and the integrator, and then adding a reporter so that we can view the output. Energy minimize the system. We can visualize the energy minimized system. Okay, great, it's energy minimized. Then we can save this energy minimized structure to a PDB relatively easily in case you want to view our trajectory in VMD or something. And then we can simulate it. We're going to set the velocities to the temperature we set in the integrator. Then we're going to run it for one minute so that some people aren't waiting longer than other people, and then just check how many steps it did, and then we can visualize the result. I remember my, I think I, I, my heart skipped a beat when I saw that you were simulating something for a minute, and then I realized that OpenMM is talking about a wall clock in this one, one situation. Yes. So we've got half a nanosecond on, um, and I've written out any, every 50 picoseconds, so it actually looks like a trajectory that makes sense rather than jumping around all the time, but it also means that there's a lot of steps. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a wiggling non canonical amino acid, um, parameters all from published force fields, kind of using the toolkit. Uh, so what we've done today is we loaded a protein into the OpenFF toolkit from a PDB file, and we saw that the molecule that was produced was just a regular molecule, just like those from any other way of loading chemistry into the toolkit. Then we used our dkit 
to add this synthetic dye to the molecule created a smiles from that that we could use to load coordinates from a, a already modified PDB. Then we combined the amber protein force field and the sage force field into a force field that could handle both general chemistry and protein chemistry, general chemistry with sage and protein chemistry with amber. And we added in some charges that we calculated ourselves for our new amino acids so that those charges don't need to be calculated every time the system is parameterized. And we used that new force field, that new combined and augmented force field, to parameterize our, our protein and simulate it with OpenMN. If you want something to try for yourself, if you really want to experiment with protein ligand systems, there's a great example called the Toolkit Showcase, which, which goes through even the steps like solvating a protein ligand system. It goes all the way from a docked structure through to a simulation, all with the toolkit. If you wanted a post-translational modified protein to try for yourself, I've just prepared some reaction smarts for the glycosylations that protein needs. So this is, this is like the smallest protein I could find that has structures for uh, sugars. That might be something that you, you could experiment with if you wanted, but I'll hand it back to Jeff to, if there's anything else to say. Thank you very much, Josh. Yeah, 